Hello, everybody. Thanks to the organizers and thank you for having us today. We are very happy to share with you a French perspective on the links between eco-spirituality and political ecology. As a preamble and to contextualize our perspective, let me introduce ourselves. I'm Damien Delorme and this is my colleague Clément Barniodi. Hello. And we, uh, both of us, um, have interdisciplinary institutional position. So I'm an environmental philosopher, but I'm currently working in uh, the Faculty of Theology here in Geneva. And uh, Clément is an environmental geographer, but he's currently associate professor in uh, the Educational Science Laboratory in Montpellier, France. So we speak uh, from the context of the French ecology politique, which for many reasons uh, mainly ignores, avoids, or even at times despises, broadly speaking, religious issues. But we got interested in this topic because we both of us have personal and pedagogical eco-spiritual practices, and because our experience of that was in conflict with uh, critical arguments we would hear in various contexts, uh, especially amongst political ecologists. So based on a paper we'll publish soon, today we would like to share our thoughts on uh, three questions. First, what do we mean by eco-spirituality? Uh, second, what are the main objections coming from political ecology and how might they be answered? And third, taking eco-spiritual practices of Zen Buddhism from the teachings of uh, Thich Nhat Hanh as a case study, can we argue that uh, the eco-spiritual is political? So first, what do we mean by eco-spirituality? We'd like to approach eco-spirituality not only as a discourse that has historically two sources, namely the spiritualization of ecology and the ecologization of spirituality, and not only as an eclectic bricolage of dark green religious creativity, but also as a set of eco-spiritual practices that could link ecology in the first person and political ecology. And by eco-spiritual practices, we refer here to a set of concrete exercises which engage the practitioner in an interior transformation, bringing to light new relations between their body-mind and the terrestrial home. So we propose to understand eco-spirituality as a threefold movement. One, the ecologization of traditional spiritual practices, and for instance, liturgical innovations identified by the World Council of Church for the season of creation. Two, the spiritualization of naturalist practices. Here you might think about John Muir, um, Thoreau, Leopold, Carson, but I will name two famous citizens of Geneva. Firstly, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and his ecstasies and inexpressible raptures during his reveries of a solitary walker. And secondly, Robert Renard, a famous, uh, here famous conservation activist, nature philosopher, and a brilliant painter, sculptor, engraver, who speaks about his relations with the wide Jura, a mountain range above Geneva in terms of love and mysticism. And that opens up towards three a poetics and a poetics of the ecological self. That could include certain artistic practices or a poetics of the everyday. By poetics, we mean a creative process or an exploration of potentialities for metamorphosis, in this case of a self incorporated in dynamic relations with all the other life forms and the world. And by in carrying out this metabolization of our ecological condition, poetics or aesthetical experience is an, is an essential dimension in as much as it resists the unidimensionality of economic and technical rationality. Co-spiritual practices are thus anchored in a sentient life daily experience of the world within which we share with the totality of the living the mystery of being a body, a body that interprets and lives its life. And that's a quotation from Morizo. And the exploration of this mystery, uh, 
become spiritual practices when attention is consciously turned towards the discovery of an ecology in the first person, that is to say, an ecology that calls for a renewed understanding of our relations to the earth on the basis of an experiential and relational process, for instance, interpreted through eco-biography, and that's a concept recently coined in French by Jean-Philippe Pierron. So that's how we understand eco-spirituality. But what are the main objections that come from political ecology and how might they be answered? A first argument consists in criticizing uh, an alleged individualist and dep depoliticizing withdrawal, which would favor the subjective acceptance of a catastrophic situation rather than the mobilization of social powers of insurrection and subversion. We find such a critique notably in Bookshin, and this is a Marx-inspired critique drawing on the infamous metaphor, religion as opium of the people, Eco-spirituality thus would aim to anesthetize the sufferings of the oppressed creature rather than to arouse its revolt. It would thus avoid envisaging the transformation of the power relations and especially the modes of production. A second argument made against eco-spirituality comes from a modern rationalist perspective which tends to identify spiritualities of the earth as exemplary instances of the fascistic offshoots of ecology. Two main ideas underpin this critique. On the one hand, the ir irrational romanticism and neopaganism has been asserted by the Nazis. And on the other, the reference to a transcendent domain working its way into political normativity is also said to be typical of reactionary and hierarchical tendencies thought to be opposed to an egalitarian principle and to the elementary demands of a pluralist democratic space. In the Francophone context, you find this criticism famously in Ferry's Le Nouvel Ordre Ecologique in 1992, but more recently in uh, neo-Marxist or anarchist against certain popular figures of spiritual ecology, such as Pierre Abbey, on the grounds of reactionary links and uh, the politicization of ecology. So how to respond? First, if there does exist within most spiritual traditions a tension between withdrawal from the world and engagement in the world, eco-spiritual practices aim to deepen the relation to the corporate or material networks that constitute our worldly existence. It thus has the potential to make us not less, but more aware of the political conditions of production, appropriation, or exploitation, which structure the power relations and injustices present in these networks of interdependence. Uh, secondly, eco-spiritual practices imply not less, but more awareness of systemic dimensions. And one can maintain that the transformation of the self is a condition of effective collective engagement, especially because the success of a collective action supposes the effective management of the famous human factor, that is to say, conflict internal to the self and to activist milieu. Thirdly, uh, the objection that stir up fear of the promotion of fascism and conservatism ultim ultimately derive from the sophism of the slippery slope. And one can respond to these fears in at least three ways. One, a careful study of diversity in political e ecologism forces one to recognize that though real, these far right tendencies are in a tiny minority and that the majority tendency would rather be to hold the center. In any case, nothing suggests that the link between eco-spirituality and fascistic and reactionary positioning is a form of necessity. Two, defendants of eco-spirituality occupy minority positions. They are not in a position to impose a reactionary order. And if the difference in strategy, for example, between social ecology and spiritual anarchism, so Bookshin versus John P. Clarke, is sometimes dramatized as irreconcilable. It should not be forgotten that the controversy is between adversaries within minority fields. So 
By considering the power relations between majority models and minority ecological alternatives, one sees that these different currents might ultimately recognize the same enemies. And three, rather than opposing religious conservatism to secular rev revolutionary progressism, is it not more pertinent to establish a polarity between, on the one hand, a dominant religiosity, which puts itself in the service of hegemonic power and conservatism, and on the other hand, an emancipatory religiosity, which resists the former and places itself instead alongside marginalized, oppressed, and exploited collectives. And that could be a way to distinguish between conservatist eco-spiritual practices and progressive, radical, and anti-hegemonic eco-spiritual practices able to nourish and support plural forms of activist engagement within intersectional struggles. So in many ways, eco-spirituality weaves together ecology in the first person and political ecology to the point where it seems possible to, refer, to affirm that the eco-spiritual is political. It is this link that we would like to explore now in more detail taking as our starting point, a case of eco-spiritual practices in Zen Buddhism. Thank you, Damien. Uh, now we would like to, to focus on the eco-spiritual practices of uh, Zen Buddhism as they have been taught by Tishnatan. As you may know, Tishnatan is a teacher and a Buddhist monk of Vietnamese origin born in 1926 as a committed peace activist during the Vietnam War. He founded the Engaged Buddhism Movement. And as you see in the picture, uh, he was nominated by Martin Luther King uh, for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1967. Very early, his teaching put forward the need for a global ethic capable of responding to the problem of today, especially the ecological crisis. Two of his recent work explicitly address ecological issue, the world we have and love letter to the earth. Therefore, our choice is justified by the importance accorded within this teaching to a new way of understanding our relationship with the earth, especially on the basis of two types of uh, practices, contemplative practices, clearly conceived and oriented towards uh, taking care of the herbs and practices of attention structured around the couple Vipassana Shamatha, which are described in the book called Awakening the Herbs, a collection of sutra translated and commented by Tishnatan. And we also refer to the work of Francisco Varela on these attentive practices. So it is this specific training of attention that we propose to examine first in order to understand what it might bring in terms of ecological engagement. And it is useful to remember that the starting point of this attentional training in the Buddhist tradition is marked by the recognition of a more or less subtle feeling of dissatisfaction. And it is this feeling of dissatisfaction unfolding within an affective dimension which pushes us to engage in an intentional training. And the basis of this intentional work consists, first of all, in developing shamatha, an attentive presence of full awareness to what emerges in the present moment. To practice shamatha may be done in any context, even though Certain formalized practices like sitting meditation or walking meditation provide either access to train ourselves, remembering to bring the body mind back to the here and now as cohabitant of the sentient herbs. This practice is also called the practice of stopping because it allows us to suspend our natural attitude to functioning, uh, automatic functioning of our consciousness and to calm the sometimes tiresome flux of our mental awareness. One of the direct effects of this training is to develop the clarity and the stability of the mind, samadhi, and to generate feelings of wonder and gratitude with respect to the unceasing miracle of life. Shamatha made possible to begin a second phase of attentional training, 
vipassana translates as observation or insight. This observation covers attentive practices focused in two directions, conscious activity of the self of or exterior phenomena. In the first case, we put our attention on the content of life experience without judging it, but simply welcoming the movement of our inner ecology from one moment to the next, focusing attention on this flux of conscious experience. The practitioner notices that he has nothing permanent. Not only do the cessation, perception, feeling change constantly, but mental awareness itself never stops transforming, flowing like a river. At this stage, a specific aptitude develops, a becoming conscious, which brings to light the very structure of perception. This practice opens up to a renewed understanding of the self. And this discovery can be reinforced by practices of attention focused on the interdependent nature of exterior phenomena. The training consists in bringing to light the set of causes and conditions of an inapparent, which, which enable, for example, a flower to bloom. By becoming aware of all the non-flower elements, like water, sun, earth, which are nevertheless constitutive of the flower. Observing in this manner, the practitioner sees that every being of phenomena cannot exist by itself. It is devoid or empty of an independent and separate nature, sunyata. When we say flower, it is only a designation we append to it. The shamatha vipassana attentional training forms an organic whole rather than a succession of practices and has ethical implication. As our habits of, grasp, of grasping, grasping is as a subject of the object diminish, a certain receptivity also develop, a particular ways of looking deeply called prajna, translate as understanding or wisdom. And from this awareness of the interdependent reality, there emerged little by little an intimate feeling of integrity and connection with all other sentient beings, which transforms our narrow self into an enlarged self, or to take up the thought of ourness, an ecological self. That is to say, a self capable of encompassing all the relations that constitute it. Moved by this feeling, caring for the earth, for other species and humans, can naturally unfold and give rise to an empathy and a spontaneous compassion. This capacity to, free, to feel from the inside, a proximity with all beings is thus a source of action bearing the mark of nonviolent ethical engagement. Ethical know-how is thus born without the intervention of deliberate will to do good or desire for transfer towards the other, but on the basis of a non-dual understanding. And it is in this sense that we can argue that eco-spirituality eco is political. Of course, this ethical attitude may remain fragile for a long while, and certain contemplative practices may be possible to sustain the practitioner. In the tradition of Vietnamese Zen Buddhism, renewed by Thich Nhat Hanh, <clears throat> uh, there exist certain specific practices which aim to bring to the foreground of consciousness this profound vision of an absence of separation between ourselves and the earth. Ceremonies of touching the earth, of beginning anew with the earth, reciting chant gathas or mindfulness training, reading or writing, or, or writing letters to the earth, all of these practices, which are often collective, helps to nourish and stabilize the understanding discovered and the commitment to preserve the earth. In conclusion, we would like to insist that if eco-spirituality resists the objection of political ecology, this is because its origin does not lie in a set of moralizing and abstract principle, but in a first person ecology turn toward new ways of intending both co to cooperate and to the links of interdependence that constitute the living. 
That's why we think that the eco-spiritual practices offer a method to actualize and embody a real political, ontological, and ethical revolution necessary to put into action the third story told by Joanna Macy, the great turning allowing us to leave behind the sad patience of business as usual and of the great disintegration, a revolution which allows us to switch from what Philippe Descola called the dualistic ontological filter that dominates Western culture to what Arturo Escobar named a relational ontology capable of bringing about new political practices that resist the neoliberal mono world. <clears throat> so here are some main reference uh, related to our presentation. And uh, we'd like to thank you for your attention. We are now available to answer any question of concern you may have and pursue the discussion of this topic. Thank you.